Well, there are many people who enjoy a good mystery. And maybe for some of the children, and maybe when you were younger, you remember reading some of the uh, children's books, uh, Nancy Drew or the Hardy Boys, and there was always a mystery that was there that would get solved at the end of that time. Uh, today, of course, adults are reading things such as Tom Clancy and other, other mystery books that are written. Uh, there are the TV shows that come on, you know, Murder, She Wrote, which is, not a, which is a good family-friendly fair, and uh, go through that, trying to figure out who is it, who done it, kind of thing. And uh, so that's part of individuals who just love, who love mysteries. There are many jobs in which individuals choose to become part of because they enjoyed searching out ministry, uh, excuse me, mysteries. They're the research scientists who are trying to unravel the mysteries of the universe, like how can light be both a wave and a particle? And that has been going on for some time. There are those who are research doctors who are trying to research and find out what are some of the causes of certain situations, illnesses that we face. Cancer certainly is one of those as they continue to research and find out what, what are, what's the mystery. And the fascinating thing is the more they dig into the mystery of the body, the creation of God, the more they're impressed with the design that's behind it. Even for individuals who don't claim to be followers of God, they would say, man, I was really lucky. Where we know that you look at the design and you realize behind the design there's a designer, there's intelligent design. There are historians who try to uncover uh, the mysteries of the past and, and the individuals such as, you know, what happened to the settlers on Roanoke Island? Where, where are they? What, what happened? Or was there really such a city as Atlantis? And we've read some different things about that. There are individuals, maybe you as parents, have had to unravel some mysteries in your household, uh, somewhat like what we have seen uh, represented for us uh, through the video. Uh, certain mysteries that maybe you don't care to unravel, but you need to unravel, like who broke the lamp? Who left the refrigerator door open and so everything melted? Who, who left the electric drill out in the rain? And so there are those kinds of mysteries or those kinds of secrets as well. There are those who are interested in studying the mysteries of their past, and so they get involved in genealogies, and they do the digging, and they do the research, and, and I, I enjoy hearing about it. I'm not so much uh, in, know how to go about all that process, but I've got family members who kind of dig into the past, and they, they love learning about certain kinds of things, and, and so there are the genealogies. Did you know that that was part of our family tree? They were part of our family tree. Don't tell anybody. They're individuals who want to know the mysteries about themselves. And so they turn to such things as what does the future hold? And, and they open up and they go to a horoscope, you know, supposedly that are telling you the mysteries of what's going to happen in your life by the stars. Don't waste your time. Even as we turn to biblical things, there are those who have looked at the, into the Bible for certain kinds of mysteries. Maybe you're aware of the, of the term the Bible code or some call it the Torah code. And the idea behind it is that there were equidistant letter sequences throughout the Old Testament, especially in, in the book of Genesis, that if you went certain number of letters and you would take those letters and you would circle them, that eventually you'd be able to spell out a code. So perhaps every, every five letters you could go, whether it was horizontally, sometimes it's vertically, sometimes it's diagonally, sometimes it's backwards, whatever you want the code to say, uh, so that you could find out what, what happens. And, and someone came up with this, uh, supposedly, during this Bible code, and this was the quote about bin Laden. Destruction I will call you, cursed is bin Laden, and revenge is to the Messiah. Now, there's a lot of problems in that. And so you don't need to use a Bible code or that kind of thing to approach Scripture. Some of you perhaps have heard of Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code in which uh, he claims uh, in that particular story that um, and you go through a long and convoluted sequence, but he claims that Mary Magdalene secretly married Jesus and they went off uh, to Europe and they had kids and supposedly the person uh, to, the, to the right of Jesus in, in, da Vin in the painting of the Last Supper was actually Mary Magdalene and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Dear friends, that isn't just silliness, that's heresy. It's not who Jesus is. 
Well, we do find in the scriptures that there are some mysteries. But they are God-given mysteries. They are sacred mysteries. They are sacred secrets that have been hidden in the past that God wants you and me to know. And you don't need some special kind of decoder glasses uh, in order to figure them out. You don't need to do the ELS, equidistant letter sequence, to find them out. That God wants us to know these mysteries that he has hidden from the past and that now he is making, he is making known. And so we continue our study in the book of Ephesians in which uh, Paul is writing for us and revealing to us a very sacred mystery that has been concealed from the past. And so I invite you to grab a Bible, turn to Ephesians chapter 3, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 7 today together. Uh, if you remember, um, and you see the front of your handout, that what does it mean to have life in Christ? What does it mean for us to live our lives in Christ? If we have come to know who Jesus is, if we become a part of God's family, if we are followers of Jesus, what does that look like? And if you remember, we've got six chapters in the book of Ephesians. And, and Paul, as he normally does, he spends the first three chapters in Ephesians telling us about truth. Truth that we need to know. And then the last three chapters is now how do we live in light of that truth? How does that if affect us? How does that impact us as we seek to live our lives on a day-by-day -day basis? And so in the section, again, as we move into chapter 3, these are truths that we need to know that Paul is going to call upon even as we continue to work our way through Scripture. And so we've, we've had glimpses of this particular mystery that Paul has given to us, but he's going to reveal even a little bit more today. So if you want to follow along in, in a Bible that's there in a chair in front of you, it's uh, page 1170. Uh, if you want to reach down and use one of those, it will be on the screen. Uh, I do recommend for you bringing your own Bible so you can mark it and draw circles and draw things together because there's a, a lot of material in here. And so let's jump into the text. The mysteries, the sacred mystery that's revealed. The first thing that we notice in verses 1 and 2 of Ephesians is is a reference to the messenger of this mystery. Who is it that's giving this mystery? And and what, was, what are his qualifications? Why should we pay attention to him? And we're going to notice that uh, regarding this particular messenger, who happens to be Paul, that he is both a prisoner and he's a steward. He's a prisoner and he's a steward. First of all, he refers to himself as a prisoner. Verse 1, for this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. I'm a prisoner. Now, if you remember just a little bit about the life of the Apostle Paul, he, he did spend a tremendous amount of time in prison. And he's being held in a Roman prison. And the reason why he is in prison is because he has sought to make known God's mystery. The fact that God was going to choose Gentiles and bring Gentiles along with Jewish individuals into one new body. We saw this back in chapter 2. That there was something new that was being formed. And when the Apostle Paul began to tell the Jewish leaders, the religious leaders of the day, that, that he was called to be a messenger to the Gentiles about God's grace, they threw him in prison. Because they thought that we as Jews are the only ones who have access to God. What are you doing taking this sacred message to Gentiles? And so they threw Paul in prison. It was the Romans who had thrown him in prison. But Paul doesn't say here, notice he doesn't say, I, I'm a prisoner of Rome. He doesn't say, I'm a prisoner of the Jewish leaders. Doesn't that strike you? He says, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And the point that he is making is that where he is is not by accident. That the events of his life are not accidental. It's not because he had broken some, some law. It's not because of bad choices that he had made in life. It's not because of things of the past, so to speak, though he had a past for which God forgave. But he looks at himself and he says, you know, I'm a prisoner of Christ. 
You know, as I read that, he, he's not disheartened. He's not melancholy. There's no self-pity. Now, don't misunderstand. Paul isn't putting on some sort of a plastic face and saying, oh, I'm enjoying this experience. It's not like many of our prisons today. If you go back into the Roman world, Paul, the prison, is, especially the Mamertine prison in Rome, was a hole in the ground. You didn't have restroom facilities. You didn't have food being supplied to you. You didn't have heat and air conditioning. You can imagine how badly it stunk. And Paul wasn't there because of some wrong that he had done. He said, you know, This is God's plan for me right now. Again, he wasn't plastic, and we read in a couple of other places, he he even writes this, Paul, uh, God who comforts the depressed, comforted me by the coming of Titus. Read that in Corinthians. So it wasn't if Paul, you know, some sort of super saint, some sort of superman, But what he was doing, he was reflecting on the fact that there are no accidents for God's people. There are no accidents in your life. There are no things in which God got so busy helping somebody else, he forgot about you. That that event through which you are going, that God is still sovereign. And that this was part of God's plan for Paul at this point in time. And we can, we can see some ways in which God used it, right? Where did Paul write most of his letters? We call them the epistles. Where did he write most of them? In prison. He was involved, Paul was involved in church planting. I want to plant churches. I want to plant churches. I want people to come to know who Jesus is and get involved in a local body of believers. I want to plant churches. And God said, I need to slow you down. I've got another, some other work for you to do. I've got some things that will have lasting effect just as church planting will. We read that that Paul often ended up by the special bodyguard when he got to Rome, by the special bodyguard of Caesar. Caesar wanted nothing to do with Christianity. He wanted to keep it as far away from his household as possible. And Paul became almost, as it were, the Trojan horse inside Caesar's household because he has a praetorian guard that's chained to him. Day in and day out, they would transfer guards. They would, the changing of the guards. And we read that my, there were individuals in Caesar's household who came to know Christ. Why? Because Paul was on the inside. God had stationed him there to accomplish something. And so he writes his letters, and Paul says, I'm a prisoner of Christ. And the events in life are not accidental. Secondly, not only is he a prisoner, he's a steward of the mystery. That's verse 2. If indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you. Now, another way of translating that is since you have heard. Because obviously they would have heard. That's why he was in prison, because he had written. And so they would have heard of God's grace and they would have responded to that grace. And so since you have heard of this grace, I'm a steward. What's a steward? A steward is a household manager. A steward doesn't own anything. He just manages or she manages the household. And so here it refers to Paul as a manager. He doesn't own it. Remember, you go back to Genesis, Adam and Eve uh, were placed in the garden as managers. It was God's creation. It was God's masterpiece. But they were just managers. And Paul says, I'm a manager of God's grace. A manager can't change the message. It's not, we can't go and say, and and there there are pressures today, aren't there? Well, you know, the Bible is archaic. It's kind of old. It was written, you know, some of the latest books were like 90 or 60 AD. And so, you know, that, that's kind of antiquated. No, the principles are very, very valid for today. 
And so Paul says, I can't change the message, and neither can we. And so I'm a manager of God's grace. Notice he says, given to me for you, in other words, to pass it on. And, and really, you and I are the same. We are called to be messengers of God's grace. You say, what does he mean by God's grace? It's talking about salvation. The coming to know who Jesus is and what he's done for us is all of grace. It has nothing to do with human effort. Baptism, which uh, we do and which is an important part of it, is, doesn't save us. But it is a testimony of the fact that we've come to know Christ. And that we're committing our lives to Jesus. Salvation isn't a matter of how many awards did you get for perfect Sunday school attendance back in the day. It's all of grace. It can't be earned. And Paul says we have, we have that responsibility as well. Because someone told you about God's grace. And through that knowledge, there was a change, a work of the Holy Spirit within your heart. And you became a follower of Jesus. God could have designed a lot of other ways. We've talked about this before to get the message across. He could have written it, you know, out there in the sky. Uh, he could have sent his angels like they did to announce the birth of Jesus. But he didn't. He said, it's us. It's our command, last part of Matthew 28. Take the good news that someone gave you and pass it on. Tell them what God has done in your life. Pass it on. So the messenger of the mystery is given to us in verses 1 and 2 that he's a prisoner and he's also a steward. And in a sense, we are referred to as servants of Christ, as ministers of Christ. And then the mystery is revealed to us in verses 3 through 5. And before we jump into that specifically, you know, it is interesting as you look at the Bible, there are different mysteries that have been revealed. Some have not. <clears throat> there are some things that God refers to as the deep mysteries of God that he has chosen not to reveal. You know, and there are times in which I, I look around and say, I wonder why that is. It must be a deep secret of God because I have no clue. I have no clue. But there are other mysteries of God that have been revealed over the course of time. The, think of in terms of Messiah, Old Testament, that there's a Messiah who's going to come. And, and the Jews understood that there was a Messiah who was going to come. But what they didn't get, if you go to Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53, 52 speaks about a suffering Messiah. And then in 53 speaks about a reigning Messiah. And, and they didn't know how to put those two together. How do you have a suffering Messiah? And it says he's going to die and he's going to be buried with a rich man in his tomb. 700 years before Jesus came. That's pretty impressive, don't you think? You didn't get that by accident. That had to be revealed. Well, he's going to suffer and he's going to die. He's going to be buried, buried in, in a rich man's tomb. But over here it speaks about the fact that he's going to be reigning and, and not a bone of his body is going to, you know, he's not going to begin to decompose and he's going to reign. So what did they do with that? They said, well, let's kind of forget about the suffering Messiah we, we want a reigning Messiah. That's why when Jesus came, you know, on Palm Sunday, we call it, they threw down, you know, branches and all this kind of thing. Oh, here comes Messiah that was predicted in the Old Testament. But they didn't understand. The Messiah had to die first. And then he would reign. But to us on this side of the cross, we get it. It was a mystery that was revealed. Or how about the coming of Christ? You can read about it in the Old Testament. Jesus is coming again. What we didn't understand is uh, they understand in the Old Testament, we get it, is that there are two comings of Christ. And I'm not referring to the rapture. I'm talking about the first coming of Christ at Bethlehem, the second coming of Christ where he rules and reigns in Jerusalem. Mysteries that were hidden. And we could go on. But in this particular mystery, Paul says, this mystery, there are three characteristics that we need to know. Again, that Jew and Gentile are being brought together. And he says there are three characteristics. First of all, this mystery was revealed by Paul, verse, excuse me, was revealed by God, verse 3. But that the revelation there was made known to me, the mystery as I wrote before in brief. Paul says, this isn't mine. I didn't make this up. This comes to you from God. This mystery is not something that we can choose to accept or reject. This is God's mystery. 
So this mystery was revealed to Paul by God. That's verse 3. Verse 4, Paul says this mystery is recorded. And by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight in the mystery of Christ. Well, guess what? We get to read it. That's what we're doing today. We're reading about this mystery that was recorded by Paul as he sat in prison. And so it's, read it, it, it's written so that we can understand it. God wants us to know this mystery. And the third characteristic is a mystery was previously hidden, but it's now been revealed through the Holy Spirit. That's verse 5. This mystery, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it is now, but revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the scriptures, in the gospel, by the Spirit. Again, we saw, we saw glimpses. It's somewhat similar to math. It's progressive revelation. You know, you, you didn't start off, unless you're a child project, prodigy, you didn't start off with, with physics in first grade. Now, some of you might be really close to that. I'm not. So you start with some basics, one plus one equals, and two plus two, and division, and math, and multiplication. The idea behind that is, is you set a foundation, and then you begin to reveal more and more, and that's what the Bible does for us. We get to see more of what God is doing, this mystery that was revealed. The first, the first glimpse of the gospel is Genesis 3.15. And you can chase the gospel all the way through the Old Testament till, the, till Christ comes. And Paul says here, I want you to know that this mystery of what God was going to do with, with Jew and Gentile in one body, it, it, there are glimpses of it in the past. Remember when Jesus had a conversation with the woman at the well in John 4? She was a Samaritan. She was a Gentile. She was really a half-breed, half-Jew, half-Gentile. That's what Samaritans were. So it didn't fit in really with either one of those groups. And Jesus is having a conversation with her. And she asks a question to kind of divert. You know, Jesus says, go call your husband, you know, go call your husband, etc. And, you know, she, she comes back with, where should we worship? Jews say you worship here. Gentiles say you worship here. And Jesus says there's coming a day where it's not going to be a place. It's not going to be a place. A hint of the church of Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 8, we, we read about uh, uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, and, and Ethiopian eunuch, you get it, he's a Gentile. And he's reading, he's reading Isaiah. He's actually reading Isaiah 52, 53. And Philip, this eunuch is riding in his chariot, and Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? He says, I don't have a clue. And how can I understand it unless somebody tells me? And he invites Philip up into his chariot, and Philip explains to him that Isaiah 52 and 53 is looking forward to Messiah, is looking forward to Jesus, who would forgive our sins, go to the cross, pay for our sins and our failures, and rise again. And the Ethiopian eunuch is, is converted. That's Acts 8. That's pre-church. But it's Jew and Gentile. We talked a couple of weeks ago about uh, Peter and Cornelius. Matthew 18, Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. And so we have this idea that, that the Spirit is, is giving us this truth. It's Spirit-breathed. What we have comes from God Himself in the 66 books of the Bible. Say, so, well, that's really nice. So what is it, the mystery exactly? All right, that's verse 6. This mystery is, is stated very clearly. He said here, to be specific, to be specific. Here's what the mystery is. Now, it's really interesting. Paul, you know, we talk about, talk about preachers going on rabbit trails, right? You've heard that terminology? I'm, I'm sure I've never done that. But the idea is, you know, you start talking about something, remind you of something else, remind you of something else. You've you probably never had that happen in your home either, right? Well, Paul kind of does that again because in chapter 3, verse 1, he starts to tell us something, but he doesn't come back to it till verse 14. Because he got thinking about this mystery that God had given. And so he's talking about specifically. So let me tell you specifically what this mystery is. Verse 6, to be specific, three things. 
that the Gentile are fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, and fellow partakers of the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. To us, it doesn't seem to make a lot of difference. It, to us, it's, it doesn't seem to be such a radical thing. The Jew and Gentile are brought together into the church, into the body of Christ, into some new entity. That if you know Christ, it doesn't make any difference if you're a Jew or a Gentile. We belong together. We're part of the same body. But that was a radical thought. You see, if a Jew would go into a Gentile's house, remember they had clean and unclean things? If a Jew would go into a Gentile's house, the Jew was now unclean. It was, and now to say that we've got a body that incorporates and encompasses all those who know Christ, and it doesn't make any difference what your religious background is. If you know Jesus, you're part of this one body. That was radical. And so Paul says, we are fellow heirs together with, with Israel. That does not mean that Israel automatically was saved. It doesn't mean that Israel automatically was part of God's people. They needed a change of heart as well. That's what Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3, pre-cross. But we are fellow heirs. We have an inheritance that comes because of Jesus. Secondly, we are members together of one body, that we as followers of Christ share the same body, the body of Jesus. We're the body of Christ. It doesn't make any difference what our race, what our nationality, what our economic background is, what our age is. We're part of one body. You remember that song we used to sing back in Sunday school? Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children. Well, he loves adults too. But it's true. Our race and our nationality makes no difference. We are one in the body of Jesus Christ. Think of what a difference that would make as we as followers of Christ impact a world that is divided by race and is divided by religion and is divided by prejudice. You know, there's this body that Christ is putting together of people from all different walks of life. Democrat and Republican and independent and libertarian and you can go down the list. Did you stop to think about the disciples that Jesus had? calls Matthew. Remember he called Matthew the tax collector. Who was Matthew? Matthew was a guy who had sold out to Rome. If you remember, the Jewish nation was, was uh, uh, Rome was superintending the Jewish nation. They had to pay their taxes. Jews had to pay their taxes to Rome. They were subjected to Rome. And Matthew was one who would have been considered as <clears throat> selling out to Rome. You know, you become part of the Roman group because you're collecting taxes which you send to Rome, but you're also ripping people off. Do you remember another one of the individuals who was part of that group? Simon the Zealot. So in that day, Matthew would have been considered a left-wing dude. In that day, Simon would have been considered the right wing. He's a patriot. He's going, to protect Rome. He's going to protect the Jews from Rome. And if Simon would have met Matthew in a dark alley some night pre-Christ, wouldn't have been pretty. And yet God, Jesus, calls these two individuals at opposite ends of the political extreme, brings them into his body to become part of his church, to share the message of Jesus. You see, that's what Jesus can do for us, changes us. So we're members of one body, and then thirdly, we're partakers of the promise, verse, again, verse 6. Partakers of the promise, notice again, in Christ. That's about the 14th time in just the first few chapters that 
Paul has used that term in Christ. If you were to say, and I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, if you were to ask Paul, what's a Christian? He said, I don't have any idea what you're talking about, but I can tell you about what it means to be in Christ. You see, there are people who would say, well, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, you know I, I'm a Christian. Well, why are you a Christian? Why, why do you say that? Well, I grew up in church. I was baptized in a church. I've done religious things in a church. The question is, are you in Christ? Well, I've always been a Christian. No, you haven't. None of us have. I've always been in Christ. No, we haven't. Every single one of us are born separated from God himself, and it is only in Christ that we become part of God's family. And that's why Paul refers to in verse 6 through the gospel. What's the gospel? The gospel is the new, good news that I've been separated, but Jesus paid for my entrance fee. That's 1 Corinthians 15. Jesus died for my sin. Are you in Christ? Is there, oftentimes we think of a point in time in which we, we enter into Christ. We acknowledge that we are a sinner in need of a Savior. Now, it's possible you grew up within the context of, of not knowing, you know, it's like, yeah, I was a sinner, but I'm trusting Jesus. I know I'm a sinner and I'm trusting Jesus. I can't point to a date. You don't have to point to a date, but are you in Christ? And it comes through the gospel. And quickly on to verse 7, Paul writes this, of which I was made a minister. He's almost coming around full circle. Of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. Paul never got over the fact of God's grace. We already, we already saw that God's grace back in verse 2. And here in verse 7, he references again, you go back to chapter 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, gift of God, not of works. Why? Because we would boast. Paul says, I've been, a, I've been made a minister. I've been made a steward of the message of God's grace. I've been sustained by God's power. You know, when it comes to the gospel, it reminds me a little bit of, uh, I took a life-saving class right after eighth grade. It was kind of a summer. We did it in a summer park uh, event. And um, one of the things that we were taught in life-saving class is you can't save somebody if, if they don't know they're drowning. They'll fight you. I don't need that. In fact, if you try and save someone who's drowning, if you don't handle it rightly, you can still end up drowning yourself because they're going to pull you under. But you cannot save somebody who doesn't know that they're drowning and need, needs help. And that's the same thing with the gospel. If I, don't, if I think I'm going to stand before God and God's going to be impressed with what I've done, I'm going to be in serious trouble. I don't dare trust the best. You can throw whatever term in. You know, 30 minutes of my life to get me into heaven. I can narrow it down to ten best ten minutes. I can narrow it down to best one minute. It's Jesus, dear friends. It's Jesus. And he radically transforms life. And Paul says, I've never gotten over the fact of what the gospel has done, that it is by grace. Three concluding thoughts. Number one, have you experienced the mystery of God's grace? Have you put your faith and trust in Christ? Are you in Christ? One of the neat things we get to do when, when we do baptism, I kind of referenced this earlier, is people get to tell us their story. A lot of different ways to do it. But they get to tell us their story of how they came to be in Christ. You know, as I mentioned, Paul never seems to get over it. Man, I hope we don't either. Oh, yeah. I'm a follower of Jesus. No, it's by grace. I don't deserve it. But God made it possible. So have you experienced God's grace? Secondly, the mystery of the church shows us that it's important. That we are connected. Now I realize being part of God's family is more than what we do on a Sunday morning. But it includes Sunday morning. 
And it is so neat to watch as different individuals use gifts and abilities and talents and, and some of it's up front and some of it's leading us in worship and others it's greeting and, and some of it's just going around being very personable saying, man, it's really great to have you here. You know, I'm not an up front person, but man, I, I, I can just let you know that I'm really glad you're here. Is there anything I can pray for you about? You see, we're part of a body, dear friends. And I think one of the things that COVID taught us is how much we miss by not being able to do that. You know, it's not quite the same thing watching y'all on Zoom. But it is a whole lot nicer to be able to do it in person. It's the wonder of the church that no matter where you travel, if you are in Christ, you have brothers and sisters in other countries There was a, back in the 1980s, there was this big church growth movement. This is, this is how you build your church. You've got to find a homogenous group. That is, you find people just like you, and you go pursue them. So you, you, you might target a certain age, or, or you might target, target a certain economic background, or you might target a certain whatever. I don't find that in Scripture. We all are part of God's family. And it's really neat to be able to watch, you know, we've, we've got infants in nursery who probably have not yet trusted Christ because they don't understand and comprehend all the way in, you know, our, our eldest uh, part of Valley Grace, 103 years old, recently went to be with Jesus. I know who the next one is, uh, not to go be with Jesus. <laughs> But I know the next, who's the next in line as far as the oldest member of our, our church family. You know, that's the neat thing. That regardless of our age, we are part of the family of God. And then thirdly, you and I have the privilege of being stewards of God's grace. We have the privilege of being messengers of God's grace. So that when you go to school, it isn't just to get an education, grateful for that, or it isn't just to teach. It's to be a messenger of God's grace. When you go to the office, it isn't just to get your work done, though you ought to do the very best, but it's to be a messenger of God's grace. You work as a cashier, and there's some people who are having a rough day and make your life hard. You have the privilege of being a messenger of God's grace. Maybe you're the wait staff in a restaurant. The privilege of being a messenger of God's grace that maybe you're one of the customers or patrons. You're a messenger of God's grace. A parent in the home. You're a messenger of God's grace. When you go back to uh, Lowe's or Home Depot for the 10th time to try and get that next part that you forgot and the shelf is barren. Maybe God's sending you back so that you can be a messenger of his grace. When you're driving down the road and the idiot, I mean, I mean the individual who's a little crazy, we need to be reminded that we are messenger of God's grace. If you know Jesus, you are called, I am called to be a messenger of God's grace. That's your purpose in life. Dear friend, that's my purpose in life. It's why God has called us to be messengers of God's grace. Let's pray. Father, thank you that somebody told us about Jesus, told us what he's done for us, told us how to break down the, sin, the barrier that's there that we couldn't do it and only Jesus could. And Father, as we look at life, we see how you've been so faithful through the good times and through the bad times, through the hard times. And we can trust you through those, that even through those, we get to be messengers of your grace if we know who Jesus is, if we've experienced it personally. That, Father, as we leave from here this morning, the greatest calling that we have is to be a messenger of your grace to a world that desperately needs to see what Jesus looks like. So thank you, Father, that somebody told us about you, and may we go being reminded that we are messengers of your grace in our specific spheres. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.